Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Pleasure's mine. One of the first questions people, you know, whenever people talk about Riz Khan in Pakistan, the first question is, where is he from? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Please, enlighten us. Uh, I was born in Yemen uh, when it was a British colony, in Aden, actually. And uh, when the British left in the end of 66, my family moved to Britain. I used to always joke that we fled with the British and then my mother got upset so I started to change it to we strategically withdrew with the British in 66. So I grew up in London, but my mother's family originally, had, she was born in Mukalla in Yemen as well. Uh, generations earlier her family had moved from Kutch in Gujarat, you know, um, in what was British India, uh, to Yemen. And my father was born in, in British India as well in Amritsar, in the partition he became Pakistani and so his family moved to Lahore. Um, so it's, it's that kind of mix, it's, you know, if it's, it's a Basically, I, the way I describe it, I have Gujarati and Punjabi blood. And what's difficult about that is I have the Punjabi appetite and the Gujarati sweet tooth, which is the worst possible combination. <laughs> Fantastic. Can you speak uh, Punjabi or uh, Urdu? Urdu? Urdu chalta hai, lekin uh, kam bolta. I speak it very little because I don't get to speak it very much. I actually really learned my, my sort of Urdu mishmash, if you like, in, in London, because growing up there, I, I was speaking Arabic as a child in, in Aden, uh, which I lost very quickly after moving to London at the age of four and a half or so. Um, and the, uh, the Urdu and Hindi and Punjabi and Gujarati and all this mix that came in really was a result of all the South Asians uh, around me in, in West London. And also my mother's family, they still speak Kachi and uh, Urdu and they have a bit of a mix. But mostly my grandmother and mother speak in Kachi, for example. My mother and my aunt, her sister, speak in Urdu or in Arabic if they don't want us to understand. And my mother spoke with my father in Punjabi. So we have kind of, <laughs> kind of an interesting mix. So I really do mix it up, <clears throat> which is embarrassing. Uh, that, another shocking news is that you got married. Yeah, for me too. And then on top of that, you have a baby. Yeah. Well, it was, it was kind of funny. It all happened suddenly. I was in Dubai and um, I met my wife there. It was about two years ago, May. Well, actually, we met in March uh, 2000. What is it now? 2000, 2005. And it all happened very quickly. And at the timing seemed to all, all the stars seemed to line up at the same time. I was living between Dubai and Atlanta. I had stayed in Atlanta effectively after I left CNN, but I was working out of Dubai as well, and, which put me nearer South Asia. It was very good. And uh, this Al Jazeera project came up and I decided to get involved with it, which meant coming to DC. She at the same time was offered a job in DC and uh, everything sort of escalated in one go. And uh, within a couple of months of getting married, she was expecting and, and now little Zara is, uh, <laughs> she bit my finger today. She bit my finger, animal. It's a beautiful name, Zara. I hope I'm right. I mean, is journalism, can I say that journalism is your passion? It is, you know, it, it's, it is because I've done it now for so long and I so enjoy doing it. It's kind of interesting, I'd, I'd like to think my passion is my life, which means a bit of everything. And I'm one of these people who, in a, in a kind of sad, but also good way, mixed too much into it. Uh, you know, I, I like music, I play the drums, um, I like art, I draw, and uh, whenever I get a chance, a bit of painting or sketching. And um, I like travel, I like languages and everything. And, and in a way, the, the journalism combines a bit of everything. Even if it's that I get to, you know, do topics on arts or music and so on. I get to meet, you know, musicians that I've, I've followed, like Peter Gabriel and Dave Matthews and goodness, and Brian Adams, you know. Wow. And then, on the other hand, I also get to work in an environment where I get to see a bit of the world as well. I get to, so my job is uh, really my passion because it so much is part of my life and it's so much a part of what news is very much what, about what the world is about. Uh, it's, it's kind of a natural flow. What is the vision of Riz Khan? My vision actually has been always in my life to have peace of mind. <laughs> That's what I've worked towards. And you'll never get that. No, actually I do. I think I have a reasonably good peace of mind. It can never be permanent. I mean, I won't say permanent. It can never be consistent because there are always problems that will come in and disrupt that flow. So it's like a sea will never remain calm indefinitely. There will always be ripples. And sometimes you need to see the waves and things to, to get an idea of what's out there. So you have to experience the bad to, to enjoy the good. But essentially, I have peace of mind. I'm generally, you know, thank God I've, you know, I'm comfortable with everything from my religion to my belief in, 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 you know, what the world is about, what people are about, what nationalities are about. I don't have any real hang-ups about stuff, so, which is a great way to have peace of mind. Some people say you have to have, you know, aggressive fire-burning passion about something, which means that you'll be driven. Well, for me, the world is like that. You know, there's so much fun out there, and I try and concentrate on that. I like to stay good-humored, too. Uh, that it's important for me to then, then keep peace of mind that way. What do you think it takes to make a Riz Khan? 
uh, as far as uh, elements are concerned? You know, what would be your take on that? I, you know, I think because I'm open-minded, I think it takes, uh, I'd like to think it takes a little bit of everything. I mean, I'm left-handed, which is kind of a strange thing, in, especially in Islam, actually. But I'm left-handed, and that um, also has its own uh, quirks. Uh, you know, I tend to be left-handed in the, the sense of the artistic and the musical and languages and stuff like this. I mean, I pick up languages generally quite quickly, um, or at least the phrases and pronunciations and so on. So for me, the left-handed thing has created patterns in my life. When I draw, I see patterns. I can draw on a small piece of paper or on a big piece of paper with the same proportions. Drums are patterns. I taught myself to play the drums, again, based on patterns. Languages are based on patterns. So all these elements come in and create, the, the patterns have all come and created my life. I have a pattern of whether it's work or play or whatever. It's all part of the same flow. So it's hard to say what, would, what makes me, um, but I know that these elements are very an important part of me. You know, the music, the art, the, the work, the life, the fun. Humor is a key, key thing, though, very much. Without it, you know, I, I, God knows how I would survive. Uh, BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, did you ever plan that? I mean, did you know when you were young that you would end up doing all of that? Well, I had planned at the age of four to write a book called The ABC of News. So I thought there has to be a network that begins with A. Al Jazeera hadn't been created, so I was waiting for that. B, the BBC, and C, C, and no, I'm just kidding. You're kidding me. <laughs> I knew this, man. No, I, no, I really, I, I couldn't have planned it. I couldn't have planned this kind of life. It, it was just kind of, kind of strange. Things have come my way at either the right time or, uh, you know, I happened to be there at the right time. But the BBC was, you know, becoming a journalist was a, uh, an accident. It was meant to be a stopgap for me going back into medicine and being a doctor. So suddenly to end up as a journalist was a shock. Um, and I could never afford to get out of journalism because the pay as a BBC radio reporter and local radio was so bad. So I ended up in the BBC, went into TV, CNN offered me a job. Um, that led to a degree of success where I could pick and choose a little bit. And then Al Jazeera came and I, I was keen to get involved. So when they approached me, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll get involved. But uh, what made you leave CNN? I mean, people have always asked Ask everyone else. It's funny. A lot of people said to me, were you fired because you're Muslim? Uh, were you fired because of September the 11th? Well, September the 11th happened about, uh, what, four or five months after I left. I left in May 2001. So either I have premonitions, like my ABC of journalism book, uh, or, or something freaky. But I, I happened to leave because I just needed to do something different. I was going at 100 miles an hour every single day. I was completely exhausted. Um, it was tiring, you know, it's, it's a tiring, tough job. I didn't think I was going to get the kind of resources and um, support that I needed to carry on at that pace. Uh, so eventually I said, I've got to do something different. Plus, it gave me a chance to refocus, to basically decelerate, catch up with myself, service the car, and then go and drive off again. You know, I was burning out. I really needed to, to do something different. But do you believe that you opened the doors for South Asians? I mean, in, in a sense that, you know, after you left, we, see, we, we, we saw Anish Rahman, uh, Dr. Sanjay, Zain, Virgi, and all these people coming up. I don't think it happened so much. I, I mean, you know, I, I've never said I've opened the door for anyone. I've been lucky, you know, that people have said to me, it's nice to see that there's a South Asian on TV or someone of color is on TV and, you know, we can relate to it. Because traditionally, people from the South, sub, you know, subcontinent South Asian uh, background weren't encouraged to be journalists. It was never considered the kind of profession someone would do in the West. You had to be a doctor or lawyer or engineer or whatever. So it was an unusual move for me. And partly necessity, because I didn't know what else to do, and it just I fell into it. But I don't think I opened the door, except that a few people said, okay, look, mum, you want me to be a doctor, I want to be a journalist. Look, he did it, it's okay, you know. And that helped, I think. A few people pointed to me as an example from what I'm told, and that helped. It happened more at the BBC, because I was the first South Asian on the BBC, and after I'd, uh, after I'd sort of started doing this, a few more started to come up, and I think they didn't get the same kind of flack, probably from their family, that I did. But uh, at CNN... I don't know. I think there were people already in America already starting to drift into media by then as well because I was at the BBC eight years in total, you know. But, the, but something, you just mentioned something really important because when you talk about fam South Asian families, they want their kids to be doctors and engineers and stuff like that. How important do you think for a society or a community to have journalists coming out? I think it's crucial to have, you know, to be represented in every um, sector of work because the fact is, you know, it'd be nice if there were some prominent, well, there are a few actually, but South Asian chefs. I mean, apart from Madhur Jafri or someone like this, but it has, there has to be something that people can say, if I want to be a chef, I can be a chef, it's been done, you know. They shouldn't have to, they should be able to pioneer. They shouldn't have to say to their parents, 
so-and-so did it, therefore I can do it. We should be able to pioneer. But South Asians have traditionally looked for security, and certain jobs, they believe, guarantee security. You know, once you're a doctor, you're guaranteed security. So it's, you know, South Asian people have never really focused on the arts in the same way because they don't necessarily see the value of it, security value of it. I think that's changing. I mean, even the film industry, you know, for the longest time, the film industry in India, for example, was very much looked, I mean, in Pakistan even more so maybe, really looked down upon. But now suddenly it's something you can aspire to, you know, as a person. Uh, the Hajj series that you did, was it personal? Was it professional? Was, was it that a became, dream? It became a bit of both. Well, it started off as professional and became personal. It was kind of an interesting uh, evolution for me because uh, when I arrived at CNN, there was a guy already wanting uh, CNN to cover the Hajj. I never dreamed I'd end up at the Hajj, you know, and I never dreamed I'd end up reporting at the Hajj. I never dreamed I'd be the first international journalist to, to report live from the Hajj. So these are all kind of blessings. The guy, uh, Jim Miller, who I have to always credit because he was the one who fought to try and get coverage of the Hajj done, he actually had um, gone to Saudi Arabia to cover the first Gulf War, 1991, and happened to see the Hajj on Saudi TV and said, this is amazing. You know, two, three million people gathering like this. Why aren't we ever covering this? At first, there was no real interest from CNN. Then there was the issue of the Saudi visas to come in and do it and getting a Muslim cameraman, Muslim reporter, and so on, because he's a Southern Baptist Christian, you know. Uh, or maybe not Southern Baptist, he once corrected me, but he's a Christian, you know, from the South of uh, the USA. And he, um, he fought like crazy to get this done. And he fought with the Saudis, who he developed a great relationship with, and said, you must let us come and film this. He fought with CNN, you must cover this story, it's important. And when I arrived on the scene, you know, I'd been there a few years by then, he said, listen, would you do the Hajj? And I said, yeah, yeah you know. So he was like, uh, let's do it. And, and we had to wait a couple of years. We were still battling with getting permission from the Saudis and getting permission from CNN. And then in 1998, April 98, we went. And uh, for me, then it became personal because I didn't expect I'd feel it so emotionally. It's a big shock, you know, going there. I was never much into the ritualistic stuff, you know, with religion because we were just going 100 miles an hour in, in Britain as kids even, you know. And to suddenly be in front of the Grand Mosque and the Kaaba and stuff is quite a shock. You know. Unbelievable feeling. It's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing feeling. And being there with the people, I think, seeing the mood of the people at the Hajj, just, it's, it's an amazing experience. I, it's hard to describe. I always say to people, I have the toughest job because I'm trying to explain something that can't be described and put it into a, a television screen. You know, it's, it's very hard. You did a great job at it. Thank you. Um, you were involved with the Pakistani channel some time back. What was that about? And no, actually, I did a series um, called International Questions, which ARY bought and then ran to death. Um, I don't know. But anyway, the, uh, but that was, it was quite a, I mean, it was a good series in the sense that um, it was done in a bit of a hurry. We didn't have much in terms of resources. Um, we filmed some fairly key people. I mean, it was some fairly high profile people covering international issues. And it was a test to see how it would work as a series if I was traveling around doing some interviews. But uh, yeah, a lot of people came up to me and then said, oh, you've joined ARY. I said, no, actually, I haven't joined. They, they bought my show. But uh, at least they ran it and it got a good airing and people got to see it, you know, as a show. It was quite an interesting one to do. Um, needed a little bit of cleaning up and logistics and stuff, but uh, it worked out. Okay. Where does this energy come from? Well, I'm a little hyperactive, it's true. I don't know. I mean, I should be a lot slimmer and lighter with the <laughs> amount of energy I've seen to pump out. But, no, actually, I, I think I've always been... I'm, I'm, generally, I'm charged by positive stuff, you know. So people say when, when you travel so much... When I left CNN, I ended up doing about uh, 600 flights in the first four years. And one year, actually, was 180 of flights. It was crazy, which is every other day. And... Um, you know, people, well, how can you keep going? How can you don't get jet lag? I said, well, I was never in one place long enough to get acclimatized. So I couldn't get jet lag because I never adjusted to a, a fixed point. But I, I have to say, it gave me the chance to meet up with people as I traveled the world. And, the, you know, the, the charge of being with friends and seeing people and socializing keeps me going. I mean, yeah, then I hit a, a wall after doing it for a couple of weeks or months or whatever. And, I, you know, for about a day or two, I'm out cold. And then I'm back into it. I mean, it's great fun. It's rare that I would have a chance. I did this a couple of times. Dinner one night in Hong Kong, the next night in Bombay, the next night in Dubai, the next night in London, the next night in, next two nights in Atlanta, the next night in Athens, Greece. You know, seven days eating like in different places with friends across the world. Great. It's a great opportunity. Only this job could do it. What inspires you? Um, I'm actually inspired, well, humor keeps me going. And I think the fact that there's so much out there, so much interesting new stuff, I find it strange when people say, oh, I'm sitting around, I've got nothing to do, I'm bored. I don't understand this when people say I'm bored because there's so much out there. If I didn't have a job, I don't know, I still wouldn't have enough hours in the day. You know, I want to learn the piano. 
Um, I want to improve my drumming. Um, though I did drum with Michael Jackson. We once. should jam. Do you play? What do you play? Oh yeah, I play the guitars. Nice. Well, yeah, we could we could jam. So you jam with Michael Jackson. I didn't jam with Michael Jackson. It's a long story, but um, but I play the drums. I, I I like to draw. I would. There's so much I would do if I had the time. So what inspires me is that there is a lot of interesting stuff in this world, an endless supply, way beyond my capacity in my lifetime to experience and do. So I want to be able to touch touch as much of that as I can. So that keeps me energized, it keeps me inspired, it keeps me optimistic, you know, it keeps me interested. And I know people have a tough life and I've been blessed with the, the facility to do it, the capability to do it, you know, I have an interest in it and I keep it. But people get bored quickly and I never understand that because there's always so much more. So that really is a, is a source of inspiration for me, the variety that there is out there. Um, and I try, I do, I mean, I try to cram too much in. I get criticized by friends that say you're hyperactive, you do this, but I try and cram as much as I can into it. As a Muslim, do you think that, I mean, there is something going on all around the world. I mean, you are with Al Jazeera. But do you think that th there is uh, negativity against the Muslims because the moderates don't speak out, they don't come out? I think it's an important point that uh, Islam's image has been hijacked by the radicals, by the extremists. And it's very important that the people who know what Islam is really about you know, how moderate it is, how accepting it is, how sort of uniformly uh, pure it can be. They don't speak out and say anything about this. So for the people who are the critics, I mean, you know, the radicals have created a weapon that the extremists on the other side can use, those who are, you know, anti the religion. And it's, it's such a shame, you know, there's so much positive stuff in this religion that could be, uh, could be trumpeted and isn't because people just don't take, take the steps to do it. Why is the religion hijacked? And I, I, it's sometimes so frustrating. Myself and the people might like, you know, a few of us like in the media, we try to change the image a little bit. I mean, Al Jazeera is not a Muslim channel. At, at, you know, if you look at it at the sort of core level, it's not a Muslim channel. It's a channel out of the Middle East. The Middle East is full of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. But Al Jazeera, one good thing that, that it is trying to do is trying to address the misperceptions, the misconceptions, and the prejudices that exist around the Muslim world, you know, the Islam, Islamic world. And I think that's really a duty we have because it's gone so far the other way. And if we can chip away at it, you know, it means we do a little more coverage, you know, on that subject because we want to try and make a dent in it. But, uh, but I do believe there needs to be more moderates speaking up because there's so many moderates in this religion that can pass so much positive stuff on. Do you think Al Jazeera uh, is, is getting whooped in the West because people in the West think that it's a Muslim channel? There's probably an element of that. I think the, the, the misconceptions in, uh, about Al Jazeera have come from a few people, especially in the U.S. administration and certainly former members of the U.S. administration, who basically used the wrong kind of descriptions for it, you know, saying it was, or, I mean, not just used the wrong descriptions, but had completely, I mean, they actually lied because either they didn't know or they didn't have the facts about things like uh, it being the voice of Osama. I mean, you know, the fact is that in saying it shows beheadings, uh, I always hold up that little clip from the Guardian newspaper that says, the channel has no, corrections and clarifications. The channel has never shown beheadings. Yeah, these kind of things uh, are hard once they're entrenched in people's minds. They're very hard to move. But but do you think like for example, I know Al Jazeera has its sources in in the in the Arab world. But I mean, when we see something uh, coming from Al Qaeda on Al Jazeera, why don't we see it on CNN and you Fox? You do. You do. Everything that was we see it on, once it once it's passed through Al Jazeera, then we see it. Well, in the same way that something reported on the BBC that the IRA tipped the BBC about might be carried on another channel afterwards. If the BBC got a call from the IRA saying this, this, and this, and they reported it, and another channel then carries as the BBC said, it's the same kind of thing. News, I mean, people to get to the news first is something that everyone in the news industry aspires to do. And while uh, Al Jazeera being the only pan-Arab regional news channel in Arabic, while it was the only one around, it was the natural target for a, an organization like Al-Qaeda to pass stuff onto. But an editorial board, at the uh, channel strictly looked through every little bit of this tape and said, what can we show, what can't we show? So it wasn't like, oh, we got another tape, let's sling it in the machine and play it. It was really, really scrutinized. And there have been times that the channel has said, we will not air this stuff. They've had tapes where they said, we will not air this stuff. They scrutinize it very carefully. In the same way, I would hope the BBC, CNN, anyone, if they got a tape, they would do the same thing. But they never get a tape. They do now, actually now, see, that's the thing. Since the uh, Al-Qaeda and these, uh, some of these operatives have started working in English, they've been pushing tapes to others first. So it's kind of an ironic, again, it's a perception that is stuck. But of course, every channel is jealous to have to carry someone else's exclusive. So it has, it has nothing to do with Al Jazeera's 
relationship with Al Qaeda? Nothing. No, it's, mean, it's an independent news organization. It is, yeah. And the thing, but the fact is, it's in the Arab world. It's a pan-Arab regional channel. It's a natural source for someone to go to if they want to hit the biggest Arab audience. This is who they would go to. And, the, and like I say, the best example I can give is when I was at the BBC. The IRA would call in, you know. But no one said, "Oh, the IRA, the BBC is the mouthpiece of the IRA." Although the BBC actually was restricted by the British government one time that tried to clamp down on members of uh, Sinn Fein and so on. They couldn't uh, speak. They could show their pictures, they couldn't have their voice, which was bizarre. So they dubbed other people's voices on. I, yeah, I, I wanted to have a quick take on that. Every time we heard somebody from IRA no, or, Shif or Sinn Féin, nobody said that these are Christian, Christian fun fundamentalists yeah. or Christian terrorists. Why do the Muslims get this branding? Well, this is the problem. This is, again, a stereotyping that's occurred. I mean, um, and I explain to people sometimes, you know, when I first moved to Britain, having come from the Middle East, you know, a lot of people thought I was the Arab kid, the new kid, you know. Um, the, the perception of Arabs in that time, at the time of Simbad and Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, was thieving Arab. The colonial British expression was thieving Arab. Uh, now it's Arab terrorist. You know, that, that evolved over, you know, two, three decades. So um, it's, it's, the, stereotype is, the stereotype has always been there, you know, with different communities and so on. People have misperceptions about, you know, Africans or uh, people from the Caribbean, that they must be violent or thieves or this or that, you know. Stereotypes are very hard to break once they've been established, and the Muslim world has suffered a lot of that. What do you think when you see B-roll stock footage of people burning flags and stampeding on American flag and Israeli flag? I mean, do you think Muslims generally I don't are think accepting? Half of them, I don't think half of them know what they're doing. I'll be honest. When you look at the mob mentality, 90%, and I really believe this, 90% of the people who are standing there burning flags and stamping and burning don't actually know. They've heard one voice in the community. Some guy has said, oh, we have to burn this flag. And they're like, okay, hey, you're burning. <laughs> Got a torch? They don't know. 90% of the people who are in the mobs who are illiterate don't have a clue. The ones who are literate and actually have a sense of what's going on in the world aren't the kind that go out there and burn flags, generally. Now, yes, there are some that are disenfranchised. Many of the terrorists that are they're active are intelligent, educated, middle or upper middle class people. They're disenfranchised and disenchanted. They're frustrated. That's a different matter, but that's a very small sliver. But the mobs that you're talking about, they don't know what they're doing half the but time. But the Western media picks that footage and then starts to come and ting on it. And of course, but then again, but then again, you see in the same way that you could say that, you know, um, and I don't know about the Arab media, but media also picks on, you know, George Bush making stupid mistakes and things like this. Politicians are up there to be, you know, made fun of to some degree. They put themselves out in the public uh, eye and, and they do get their fair share of that. But it's true, yes, there's, there's a lack of sensitivity and a lack of thought given to some of the footage that is culled. It's misrepresentative. You know, if there's like 10 people in a small group and the rest of the square is empty and you just close crop on those 10 people, it can look like the whole square is filled. It can look like a mob. It's easy to distort something. Do you think that created some kind of problems for Al Jazeera to be aired in America? because of the perception and because people in America think well, it's that... it's all part of a bigger picture. It's all part of the fact that there is a fear about Islam, there is a fear about Arabs, there is a fear about you know, the Middle East area in general. There is a fear having, having had the first major attacks on U.S. soil on September the 11th, hideous attacks that, that affected everyone, not just Americans. It affected you know, various nationalities, it affected Muslims as well. Um, that fear, that cumulative uh, fear is... is, is now they need something, an enemy, a focus, and this, this is an easy focus. And it only needs a few people to say, this is, this. it's the same kind of, there's a mob mentality on both sides. You know, all Arabs must be terrorists, all Americans must be evil. There's the mob mentality, it's very sad. As a, a, as a human being, what would be your message to, to the average Pakistani youth who's been watching you, respecting you, and learning from you, what would you say to them? Well, first, always keep an open mind. It's very easy to be misled. And young people want to be part of something. They want to be part of movement. Um, you know, Pakistanis are under great suspicion. I have had far more trouble going through U.S. airports with my name, Khan, and a British passport. They, they think British Pakistani and pull me aside. Even though, you know, I've been coming in and out, I've been living here 14 years, it's because a suspicion has been built up around Pakistanis, for example. But keep an open mind. You know, it's very easy to be misled and to think that, you know, there's an easy solution in, in um, taking the wrong path. You know, an easy solution in, in, in venting frustration and anger. It's always easy to get the wrong picture. Americans are not bad people. Americans are some of the most giving and philanthropic people I've come across. I mean, they really are. But the trouble is that all the people get to see overseas, including in Pakistan, is the sliver of politics that is portrayed negatively. 
In the same way that the people here in America, they get to see, they hear about Pakistanis, is that these guys who are planning this terrorist attack or that did this or did that were Pakistanis. We, we, this, it's the, the, the veneer that people are getting a representation of, the wrong veneer as well, the bad side. So Pakistanis have to keep an open mind. America can be a great source of inspiration if approached the right way. I always say, look on the internet, explore, go out and see what's out there in the world. Don't just take news from one source, don't just listen to one person. One thing I've learned as a journalist is there is always more than one side to a story. You may agree more with one side than the other, but there is always more than one side. And people mistake opinions for facts. Just because someone has an opinion, it doesn't mean it's a fact. And people tend to make this big mistake. Go out there, hear lots of opinions. Go out there and seek the true facts. And don't confuse opinions with facts. What is next for Riz Khan? That's a good one. I wish I knew. You know, I hope I get to do all the things that I want to do. You know, I hope I do get to learn the, to play the piano, get to learn Arabic. I've been wanting to learn the language again since I was a kid. Um, but, I, you know, I also want to see my kids grow up. I want to see, you know, life and experience it. I don't want to lose track of my friends. My closest friends are people I grew up with. In a couple of weeks, I go skiing with guys I was at school with from the age of 11. And one of them is my former teacher. Um, so it's, it's very important for me to maintain in my life those influences, those people that were very special to me from an early age. I don't, I don't want it to be a transient life that I flip in and out of different um, pools. So I think ultimately um, I will always try and pursue what I consider to be the right path for me and my family. And also one that gives me, continues to give me new experiences. Now I'm lucky, I'm in an industry, in a job that allows me a great variety in experience. And I think that will keep fueling me to stay in this industry and do things. Whether it's on you know, sides here or there, but I have great plans. I'm, I'm actually developing a video game, for example, with some friends. The first Arab hero in a video game, you know, proper Arab hero with a, something very positive. So things like this will always, I mean, there'll, there'll be something new to talk about soon, I'm sure. How important do you think it is for Muslims to realize that God is Rabbul Alameen, not Rabbul Muslimin? Well, yeah, I think that's important. Uh, people tend to forget. You know, I had a great interview with Desmond Tutu recently, who made an interesting point. He's very funny. He said, thank God I am not God. Otherwise, I would have to say that Osama bin Laden and George Bush are both my children. But he made an important point. He said, God is not a Christian. You know, and Muslims have to realize this too. It's, it's about a bigger picture. It's the world, you know. And uh, Islam should not be afraid of itself. You know, we should not be afraid. Uh, to be Muslim, and that's that's part of the problem. A lot of people are afraid to be Muslim. They're afraid that you know God is unforgiving, or they're afraid that God has set a path that you know they are told by other people. People can discover. I mean, the whole point of Islam is it's an individual religion. It's about a person and God, you know. And I think that's what we have to realize as Muslims. It's us and God. God is watching all the time. It's what we do that counts, not what other people do. We have to just make sure we stay on the right path. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Imran. My pleasure. Thank you.